Thank you very much for coming today, for making the time. This series, this seminar is part of a series we're running on COVID-19 and the working class movement in South Africa. And it's, it's part of a larger series that we're running as the Neil Agate Labor Studies Unit. We run a labor study seminar series. Um, Pre-COVID really, it was a thing in the town. We're in Makana, formerly Grahamstown. Uh, but we, we're repositioning and it's, it's a very interesting experience. I see we've got people from all over the world here. So you're all very welcome. Thank you for coming. Now, Pat Horn, um, for those of you who don't know her, uh, is coordinator of the Central Bargaining Project, uh, Central Bargaining in the Informal Sector Project in WeGo. She's a veteran trade unionist and feminist. She was a founder of StreetNet. She's still involved with that. StreetNet's got affiliates in 57 countries uh, across the world. And she also represents the Nedlac community constituency um, in the South African task team for the implementation of ILO recommendation. Sorry, I'm just admitting somebody. 204, which is about a transition of the informal economy to a formal economy. And Pat, Pat will, of course, explain what she's going to talk about. So I'm, I'm not going to preempt uh, her on that. Um, I should just, I was asked by Jane just to mention a bit about um, Neil Agate, for whom we named. And I'll just use that to talk a bit about our center. So the Neil Agate Labor Studies Unit is a uh, project at the university known as Rhodes. It's a project that's involved in policy work, research, and worker education. For example, we run a program with the Metal Workers Trade Unions, uh, where we've got several modules. We run an annual Wuyasili Mini Winter School, where we draw in people from unions, also from informal workers' organizations and other sort of non-traditional work organizations. And uh, naturally, we couldn't have it this year, but last year we had people from all of the big federations. We had uh, the local collective of waste pickers, people from the local unemployed uh, uh, people's movement, which you may have seen the UPM in, in Makana is made a bit of news because it took municipality to court and the judge at the high court, we have a high court in town, found the municipality was violating the constitution um, in its disgraceful services and in particular for the township. I mean, the apartheid legacy is something very, very visible here. Now, as NOLSU is the Neil Agate Labor Studies Unit, we draw strength from our location in the Eastern Cape which in, in some ways is uh, exemplifies the contradictions of a, the apartheid legacy and of the post-apartheid state and policy. Now, Neil Agate, Dr. Neil Agate, Neil Hudson Agate was a trade unionist involved in the South African trade unions, in particular in what is now the Food and Allied Workers Union. He was born in Kenya. He studied in Makana at Kingswood. Um, as a young man, he dedicated his life to trade union work and he was arrested by the security police and he died in custody. There's still an inquest going on, uh, but it's clear that he was beaten and tortured, put in isolation and committed suicide. So we try to honor his legacy as a champion of the working class and we try in our small way to make a contribution to the working class movement broadly understood and the struggle for social and economic justice and workers' power. I'm gonna hand over to Pat without any further ado. Um, Pat, I think you, you're also gonna be sharing some slides. I'm gonna just yes. pin Pat up as the main video when I can work out how to do that. And Pat, it's, it's really yours. So we'll have Pat presenting. If you've got any questions, just wait till, till afterwards. She'll speak, I don't know, at 20, 30, 40, 200 minutes, Pat, 300? I don't know, something like that. 300 minutes, is that right? Uh, 300 minutes? No. Anyway. We'll 300 minutes is about five hours. Uh, yeah, that's what you asked for, right? Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But anyway, when, when she's finished, we'll, we'll take a couple of rounds of questions and uh, we'll also look in the, in the comments in the chat bar and we'll try to keep it participatory and that. So thank you everyone, you're welcome. Pat, thank you very much for coming and I will now recuse myself. Okay, um, thanks very much, uh, Lucien. I'm going to just put up now uh, my slides, if I can find them, if what's happened to them. Um, sorry, I think I just have to uh, 
now close some other I had them up just now, and uh, um, I'm just going to close some other screens because um, I seem to have different screens here and uh, not the one that I want to show you. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. It's that I've got the wrong. Okay, I hope you can all see uh, that work of art on, on the Durban beachfront done by uh, sand sculptors, part of the informal economy in Durban. And this was what they thought about uh, the coronavirus. Can you all see it? The one that said the virus must fall. Okay, yes, so yes, I assume that that's thanks. fine. Yeah. Thanks, okay. So that was interesting because this was just before the lockdown because during the lockdown, we couldn't even go and walk on the beachfront. So I took this picture just before the lockdown started and it was already, the, the virus was having an impact on their work. Um, so this is, uh, this is some of the art which they did. So basically, when uh, COVID-19 arrived um, and resulted in the national lockdown, then all workers in the informal economy were not allowed to work. And immediately, this created high levels of hunger and distress because people had no alternative. Um, workers in the informal economy, when they saw the lockdown coming, so on the 20th of March, a week before the lockdown started, they called on the government to make urgent arrangements to establish a living cash grant, is what they called it, for all informal workers, regardless of nationality. Uh, this resulted in the special COVID grant of 350 Rand a month for six months. Um, but it was only announced four weeks into the lockdown after people hadn't been working for a full month. But after the announcement, it took another, it took another six weeks to start paying it out and it only started to get paid out in the middle of June. And the amount was much less than hoped for. We had heard rumors that it was going to be 700 Rand and we began to complain that that was too little. So we were horrified when 350 was um, announced. So th this meant that the majority of workers in the informal economy preferred to go back to work if, if, they, if they could in order to eke out a slightly better livelihood. So then they called on different tiers of government to help make their work safer with the following interventions, mass provision of protective masks and gloves uh, to informal workers, especially those working with members of the public with organic and waste materials and where cash exchanges hands. That was specifically the gloves issue. And then mass provision of water, soap and sanitizers in public spaces. So the first thing that's important to say is that the informal economy consists of different sectors. It's not an informal sector. And the different sectors include, uh, you know, you already saw the, the sand sculptors. They're not the most typical, but they're included. So all kinds of street traders, market traders, market, espaza shops, traders, informal cross-border traders, different kind of waste pickers, including street collectors, as well as those who collect on sand landfill sites and recyclers, taxi workers, including drivers, conductors, and washers. We're not talking about the associations here. Those are the bosses. Uh, they're also informal, but they fall on the boss's side, not on the worker's side. And then home-based workers, including care workers, including you know early childhood development, as well as geriatric care and community health workers, domestic workers, agricultural producers, and subsistence fisher people. Now, among all of those sectors, some informal workers have employers, but are informally employed by virtue of not being registered for UIF or uh, uh, workman's compensation or any other employment related social security schemes. So this applies to the majority of domestic workers, agricultural workers, taxi workers, 
who do have employers, even they might not be the same employer every day, but their employers are also largely not compliant with the relevant labor laws, even though those laws exist, including the basic conditions of employment or sexual determinations. So 18.8% of all workers who have an employer are informal in this particular sense. Others of other informal workers are self-employed and before COVID they numbered 1.774 million people. It's definitely increased since then. We don't have a new number yet. And they also don't employ social protection beyond universal grants. If they're over 60, they can get that. Or uh, uh, child maintenance, um, you know, they could get that. So, um, and, but many of them provide services to communities like providing cheaper services and goods, including fresh food, which we discovered early in the lockdown and the collection of recyclables, which also creates huge savings for municipalities. It's also important to recognize that workers in the informal economy are already organized in democratic membership-based organizations. This is often not recognized and you have people talking patronizingly about the fact that these people are not organized. These people, as they like to call them, are organized. Some are registered as trade unions where the laws permit, uh, but trade unions of a new type with new organizing strategies. Others are recognized as associations, alliances, federations, cooperatives, or just social movements. Uh, the woman that you see in this picture belong to um, a, uh, an association um, of uh, workers in the informal economy in Mozambique who are affiliated to the National Trade Union Federation, OTM. This was during a, a May Day march. Um, so then the issue is what did workers in the different sectors say when COVID came along? because one does need to look at sector by sector. I've mentioned the common issue about the basic income grant, but then there are certain specific issues. So for informal traders, what they needed was a reduction of red tape to an absolute minimum in municipalities permit systems. And the point they made was that now is not the time to introduce difficult administrative issues, which municipalities had failed to resolve before the lockdown started. So informal traders, leaders, and leaders of spaza shop associations, they said, can play a role in disseminating health guidelines for informal traders in street smart uh, when we managed to get COGTA to allow them to start trading because people were crowding out the supermarkets. And so they opened up early in April for informal traders selling food, uncooked food. And for people in these sectors, if they support it with airtime, they can disseminate extremely widely. So the organization in the sector, the national organization is CITA, South African Informal Traders Alliance. It's the most nationally representative since it was formed in 2003. But there are also organizations at city level. Some, most of them affiliated to CITA, but not all. There's a very representative one in Joburg called the Joburg Informal Traders Platform, and, and there are others. Then when it comes to workers working in public space, which is informal workers, the demands which they then developed and which have been uh, circulated in, in the guidelines uh, about working in public space, firstly is uh, a demand for do no harm, that police and other enforcement officials need to stop harassing traders. Trader harassment's not new, it didn't start with COVID. Unfortunately, it, it was, was supposed to stop then and it didn't. Also, they were asking for the prohibition of confiscation of traders' goods during lockdown for the same way in which there was an, uh, a regulation that there should be no evictions. We also know it hasn't been entirely uh, complied with, but we wanted a similar uh, regulation. Then to facilitate tr safe trading is the key issue. So the demand was to provide unlimited water points so that traders can wash their hands, workplaces and products frequently, provide sanitizers and or bleach as a matter of urgency, be flexible about trading layouts so that street and market traders can practice physical distancing and to allocate or repurpose more land or more streets for trading. Then to identify unused space like fields or parking lots where food markets could be set up and then to provide health screening at, at trading sites. Then there's a demand for simplified licensing and suspension of fees 
to make the issuing of permits simple and fair and to suspend trading fees while traders reestablish themselves. Because remember, they had two and a half months before people could even apply for that 350 Rand uh, special COVID grant. And then the demand for income support and grants, which I've already talked about, uh, because workers in the informal economy were very hard hit. They were not able to apply for these special TERS grants that apply to workers that um, you know, are able to apply for UIF grants. And traders had used their last savings during April and May, they used their last savings over the lockdown so that even to get started again, many of them needed cash grants. When it comes to the taxi sector, they put forward demands. We managed to get them actually into NEDLAC. Um, and uh, these are the demands they put forward in NEDLAC. They said they want to be directly represented with the transport ministry and sit in the NEDLAC community constituency. They don't want the taxi owners organizations to represent the taxi workers and the auxiliary services of the taxi industry. They feel that only they, that those guys only re represent the owners and they don't speak for or look after the works, uh, needs of the workers. The COVID-19 relief funds for the industry, which uh, were, were, were promised to the industry, they haven't been accepted yet. There's still an argument about that. But the drivers were saying these are unlikely to be filtered to the grassroots level. Um, and the, the workers on the front line are likely to continue to, to be ignored. Um, they demand that the Department of Labor need to be recognized taxi workers and accredit them with the UIF scheme. And as taxi workers, they are willing to contribute towards both the UIF and the workman's compensation funds. The problem is they have non-compliant employers. They said, we constantly find ourselves in the situation where taxi workers are ignored and left out of all negotiations. Because the transport department says, we are talking to the industry. When they talk to the industry, they don't talk to the workers, they talk to the associations who happen to be the employers. So the workers are saying that by registering the taxi workers, this would reduce the unemployment rate by 15% and regulate the industry. Um, and they said that the taxi industry represents 65% of the transport industry. I think for working class uh, uh, populations, it's higher than that, it's about 85%. And what they were saying is that given the right tools, the taxi drivers and marshals could monitor and record, and record passengers in relation to COVID-19. So they were willing to play a role in, in managing the health issues um, in the transport sector, which, which is extremely important because that's a major vector for transmission. As we speak, the Department of Transport is organizing a natural, national taxi lechotla on Thursday and Friday, tomorrow and the next day. But we still don't actually know to what extent taxi workers' voices will actually be heard there. There are two taxi drivers organizations participating. The one is called Klinam uh, Shayeli. It's a taxi workers union for drivers, conductors, washers and rank marshals organized in KwaZulu-Natal and in Pumalanga. And then there's a taxi South African Taxi Drivers Workers Union, which is affiliated to Kasatu, which has some level of national presence, although it's, it's strongest in Gauteng, and it was recently formed. In fact, during the COVID time, they launched, and we're working with, with both of them. Then informal cross-border traders. Now, as you see from the picture, there's an organization they belong to called the Southern African Cross-Border Traders Association. Many StreetNet affiliates in the SADC countries who also belong to StreetNet also uh, either belong to or work with uh, the S Southern African Cross-Border Traders Association. And their issue is that there needs to be clarity with regard to the reopening of borders because most borders are open for goods to move across them, but not people. And most informal cross-border traders move across with their goods. So there's a lot of work being done of people now doing e-commerce and um, getting people to carry their goods across the border with them. But the question of the reopening of the borders affects their goods. And there's a system called the Simplified Trading Regime, uh, which helps for seamless border crossings. We probably need another whole workshop on, on that issue, but it's very interesting. And it's, it's something which has been developed uh, in Comesa countries, um, the community of, of Southern and East Africa, uh, by informal cross-border trade organizations. That's um, an, another major series of, of demands. 
Then with waste pickers, the main demand of waste pickers long before COVID, and it's even more relevant now, is for the integration of waste pickers into solid waste management policies and waste plans of municipalities. In line with the waste pickers integration guidelines that were developed with very broad consultation with all the stakeholders, the researchers, the business sector, the waste pickers themselves, different organizations of waste pickers. And the picture here actually isn't from South Africa, it's, it's organized waste pickers in, in Brazil, what they call catadores. And they've got a very active uh, movement there. They, they call it a movement, not a union. In South Africa, waste pickers are nationally represented by SAPA, the South African Waste Pickers Association. But there are also city-based representative organizations, for example, ARO, African Reclaimers Organization in Johannesburg. And we have two people from ARO you know, with us in, in this meeting. And one of them is also on the board of SAPA. In domestic workers, um, as we heard, they have an employment relationship. And uh, in South Africa, they organize into two trade unions as well as, well as an alliance, including migrant domestic workers. So Sadsawu, which many of us know, which is affiliated to Kasatu, and then one that was formed more recently, the United Dem Domestic Workers of South Africa. And then there's this alliance called the Izwi Domestic Workers Alliance, which focuses quite a lot also on, on migrant work issues as do the two unions I've mentioned as well. And during COVID-19, it was discovered that non-compliance by domestic workers employees with UIF provisions is approximately 80%. That's extremely high. And domestic workers are still not covered by the um, workman's compensation provisions, COIDA. And currently they're campaigning very hard to be covered by this for, for injury on duty. Then home-based workers. Home-based is different from domestic. It's people who produce things at home. And through the ILO and WIGO, home-based workers are getting registered on a database at the moment for the large-scale production of masks. That's a new market that came up, including mapping about how many members they have, what they're currently doing, and what would be their capacity to produce masks. And this database is to be shared with relevant departments that would guarantee a transparent way of allocating government orders to all the home-based workers. One is hoping that by um, cutting out intermediaries, some of the really high level of uh, corruption with PPEs could be short-circuited by a, a more direct process like this. Then community health workers are people that are registered, but they're not employed with provincial authorities. They are euphemistically called volunteers. And during the COVID-9 pandemic, they've been expected to offer their services voluntarily even without being provided with proper PPE or safe transport. And they also have no social protection coverage. So recently there was a higher court judgment in Gauteng, which has obliged the province to permanently employ all community health workers. And community health workers belong to quite a few different unions. Um, and here are members of the National Union of uh, Community Health Workers. Uh, in your backyard, um, in Bishu, uh, campaigning for, uh, after the Gauteng judgment, for Eastern Cape community health workers to be, um, to be employed permanently. And as you can see, this was just after Mbengashe had um, uh, attacked them in, in one of their earlier um, uh, uh, demonstrations. So in fact, around the country now, organizations of community health workers are, are lobbying and campaigning for permanent employment. Then uh, the, the, the subsistence fisher folk indus, industry or sector. Here we've got, we've got city-based um, or, you know, coastal city-based organizations. And there's um, the KwaZulu-Natal subsistence fisher folk belong to something called the KwaZulu-Natal Fisher People's Forum. And this was during one of the joint marches of different sectors of the informal economy. They basically demand access to the fishing spots as well as railway transport, because some of the fishing spots are in the port and they need to get there by, by railways. It's much cheaper than the minibus taxis. So their demand um, also is a drastic reduction in red tape with regard to their access to piers and um, Okay, so there's something in front of my, uh, whatever it says there. You can see it, I can't, because I've got a pop-up on my screen. So the KwaZulu-Natal Fisher People's Forum is affiliated to SEDSI, the South African 
Durban, the, the South Durban Community Environmental Alliance, which is a social movement. Many of you will know them because they're very well known on environmental issues and they organize fisher folk as well as um, uh, uh, urban farmers. And there are other fisher people's organizations in other coastal cities. There's one in the Eastern Cape and um, I don't remember their name, but Paul Shambira who's with us might remember their, their name. So those organizations are organized, you know, in, in the different cities so far. Then uh, as, as, as a cross-cutting issue, there's plenty of migrant informal workers, either economic migrants or asylum seekers. And as far as asylum seekers are concerned, there were already massive backlogs in the issue of, as of asylum seekers permits. And some uh, Department of Home Affairs offices had stopped taking new applications long before COVID. So as a result, there are many, many asylum seekers who are still not documented as required by permit regulations. And it's through no fault of their own. They literally can't get documents at the moment. And there are quite a few organizations of migrant workers, um, including refugees and asylum seekers, including WASA, not the media one, the Migrant Workers Association of South Africa, MIWUSA, the Migrant Workers Union of South Africa, the African Traders Organization in Joburg, which is a, a mixture of South Africans and non-South Africans, but at all lead levels, including leadership. But it's also important to note that in organizations like SAITA, SAOPA, and ARO, their membership is open to all informal workers of all nationalities, and they are committed to international worker solidarity. So sometimes people are students, but there's, there's a level of international worker solidarity that operates in many of these sectors, and it's important to bear that in mind. Then there's the issue of new forms of work, like platform work based on internet platforms and easily accessible popular apps. And these are increasingly common in the service sector. In the industrial sector, the robots, which are the, you know, the new technology might be a bit less accessible, but in the services sector, they're much more um, accessible. So this sector is often called the new informal these days. And it's due to the fact that these new forms of work are being informalized as soon as they appear. And due to the fact that governments seem to be generally very slow to integrate the emerging new forms of work into their regulatory systems. And when they do, it's often to criminalize them. So one consequence of this is that many of the workers engaged in these new forms of work have become own account or self-employed workers. And the work they do has become own account work undertaken at the initiative of currently officially unemployed or underemployed workers who can't find employers to, send their, to sell their labor power to, and nor can they succeed as entrepreneurs in small enterprises because they can't accumulate. So they are joining the growing reservoir of de facto own account workers, irrespective of what the system labels them as. They labeled as all sorts of things, contractors, uh, you, you, you name it. There's, there's lots of euphemisms. So the new forms of organization of workers in the sector are emerging, and most notably, as we, as we all know, in the transport and food delivery sectors. Um, and in fact, innovative systems of collective bargaining are also emerging, not so much in South Africa, I'm afraid to say, but in the world, for the negotiation of contracts establishing agreed wages and working conditions in these sectors. In Sao Paulo, in, in Brazil, um, it's been very interesting. Uh, the food delivery vendors who are called entregadores um, increased by 20% during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and there was already this union. And I mean, I discovered this union on Facebook. I didn't know them. And uh, they had the strike in July 2020 in protest against what they were calling their fascist working conditions. And they did it under the Black Lives Matter slogan, because timing wise, it corresponded with what was happening in the US and uh, the majority of entregadores happened to be black. There are similar racial demographics in the working class in Brazil to what we have here in South Africa, especially in these uh, uh, precarious sectors. But then the Brazilian trade union movement could, um, they had started discussions during 19 about how to organize new forms of work. They consulted widely among 
um, organizations in the informal economy in different countries about innovative non-traditional methods of worker organization. So they also launched a union on the 9th of October. I was a guest at that launch, virtually, obviously, uh, and where they launched a new union of autonomous workers called CIPATE, which in, in a virtual elective conference, they even had their election. Um, and uh, this was the, the poster, the invitation. And CIPATE is now affiliated to CUT's commercial union, which is called CONTRAX. It's also affiliated to CUT itself and also to UNICAB because CIPATE is a Sao Paulo based union. They have this thing of city based unions in, in Brazil. It's, it's not something we have much in South Africa. So they are also affiliated to UNICAB, which is a national street vendors alliance in Brazil, which is affiliated to StreetNet International. And there's some common leadership actually in UNICAB and in the new union um, from their UNICAB's Sao Paulo based leadership. So, you know, this is, this is really a part of the working class and needs to be accepted as part of that, particularly by the formal trade unions. And um, I think we need to encourage our trade unions to follow the example of CUT uh, in Brazil. So then looking now at this new normal that we are facing. So, you know, in the, in the bloodbath, uh, you know, that we are facing um, and the permanent behavior changes that are, that are anticipated, um, the most immediate is being more people working from home, most of us. In StreetNet and WeGo, we were already doing a lot of work from home, but now it's almost exclusively, you know, from home. We do hope to get out of the home after a while, but um, we can do a lot in the home and we can collar um, reluctant uh, government officials much more easily from home. So there's much more virtual conferencing, much more, uh, more platform work has sprung up. The actual quantity of platform work has sprung up because when restaurants opened up, many of them didn't start sit down meals, but the delivery business carried on. So there's, so there's an enormous, that, that increase of 20% they saw in Brazil, I, I've noticed that actually just in Durban, um, partly because my neighbor had a tenant who was working in that sector. So I had a lot of interviews with him. And e-commerce is starting to be used much more widely in many sectors. So the question then is whether this can be turned into a transformative recovery program for the working class, both with and without work. So let's think about it. In Cuba, after the sugar industry collapsed for completely different reasons, a large part of the resulting the unemployed industrial workers became own account or self-employed workers, selling goods and services. Many of them in the tourist industry because they, Cuba's also in the Caribbean or the, the Southern part is, the Southern coast is. And so, um, in 2010, the, the Cuban government formalized this proletariat of what they called cuenta propistas, which means own account workers, by passing a law which recognized them as workers and enacted super simple registration procedures for them to regularize their status. Until that law was passed in 2010, 75 to 80 percent of the working class in Cuba was outside of their laws. So it, it, was, it caused a problem to the government. So what could we learn from this? Well, Let's look at you know, Cuba. What you're seeing here in front of you are two different um, situations in uh, the, the town of Cienfuegos. The one was a, is a market. All those workers are, repre are, re are registered cuenta propistas. And then in the bottom, uh, the uh, horse-drawn taxi rank. Um, those are also cuenta propistas. So, you know, everybody who's doing this kind of work that is normally sitting outside of regulation can get regulated. So clearly what we need is immediate legal reform for all own account workers to be able to register to be recognized and protected by law through inexpensive user-friendly processes in accordance with the rights-based ILO recommendation 204 on transitions from the informal to formal economy. This is what's meant by transition. It doesn't mean chase everybody off the streets and expect them to somehow find a, a, a formal employment contract. It means formalizing their conditions of work, uh, letting them register. It, it'll be the same kind of work, but let it be registered, let it have access to social protection, uh, rights to sit at the negotiating table, etc. And this process would also create a register, which has been missing up to now, which would facilitate administration of social protection. 
And you know, we're coming onto this issue now, we're starting to campaign for basic income grant. The first complaint by government is we don't have any register. Well, that's, that's what we need to do. So the question of databases then is an important issue and workers in the informal economy during COVID became very painfully aware of this because they suddenly all started being asked for their databases for all of this um, uh, relief funds, which um, so far it seems to be a bit of a phantom issue. Very few people have got it. Some people have, but for all of that, you need databases. So inclusive information needs to be collected according to different sectors of the informal economy. You can't just do it as a one size fits all thing. So both from workers as well as economic units in the informal economy, economic units meaning small businesses, micro enterprises, cooperatives, it's the unit side of it. And then on the other side is the worker side of it. And then it needs to be disaggregated by gender, by age, by disability and by nationality. And it needs to be inclusive of everybody in the sector, whether they have permits or not, whether they have documents or not, whether they're allowed to be in the country or not, in order to enable for accurate and effective planning. So data collection also has to have the capacity to track movements in these sectors. Now, for example, over the COVID period, these sectors are, are growing. As the informal economy grows and subsides with changes of the informal economy, and is still growing as unemployment in the formal economy increases as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Static databases, you know, which were produced five years ago are completely ineffective for capturing this moving target, which is, which is a, a characteristic of the informal economy. So looking now at this issue of the digital sector, uh, and the question, the possibility of, of having some people's control of the digital sector. Is that really such a far-fetched idea? So for example, the digital means of production in the service instead of multinationals such as Airbnb and, and Uber. Um, this, this would mean some sort of a takeover by people's apps. And we know that there's plenty of kids in the township who are making apps all the time. Um, so it's a technology which is, which is you know, user friendly, particularly uh, the younger uh, generation. And given that there's been a collapse of many malls, which started long before COVID, due to technological changes in banking and starting in the retail sector, we, we've already seen this starting to happen in, in the malls. It was a discussion point before COVID-19 came and fast tracked everything even more. And then fundamental changes in both supply and demand in the taxi hailing sector. The, the market in the taxi hailing sector didn't exist before Uber came along. Now there's a whole market of people who use that form of transport. It's a market that now exists. So the list of new examples is growing by the day. Uh, food deliveries has, has grown an enormous amount, but there's lots of different kinds of work where this kind of technology can be used. It can be applied to domestic work. I saw something about that the other day. So we, we need to look into whether we should be looking into a campaign for people's control of the digital sector and taking it away from the big multinationals. In the transport industry in Africa, the dominance of Uber, which was the multinational pioneer, is reportedly losing ground to what they call local techies who are tailoring products and services to suit customers in cities for example, the Kenya-based Little Cab, an app-based ride-sharing service launched in 2016 by the mobile phone operator Safaricom, operates just like Uber, except that it accepts the local cashless mobile pay uh, payment system M-Pesa, unlike Uber. And according to Safaricom's 2016 annual report, Little Cab had been able to slow Uber's attempt at grabbing a huge chunk of the market. Now that gives us something to think about. So I've, I've given you the reference there of where I found that uh, in, in, in this um, magazine called Africa Renewal. So this seems to suggest, and this was before COVID, this seems to suggest that there is potential for what they've called local techies who are part of the workforce of own account workers to take control of new technologies for the benefit of working class communities, even to the extent of breaking the stranglehold of the multinationals in such sectors. So when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution and the informal economy, it, it seems that our campaign needs to be for 
uh, free Wi-Fi for all, including in the uh, townships and the rural areas, and not only in hotspots, everywhere. So it means the demand to the municipalities is to budget for free Wi-Fi everywhere. It's doable. Um, I know that I once experienced this in, in Milan in, in Italy, where I suddenly found my Wi-Fi working because Milan has free Wi-Fi. Now, um, it's something that we need to, it, it, you know, we need to get um, rolling out of spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. But this seems to be something we should, uh, an economic demand we should be lobbying for because it would strengthen those workers, the marginalized workers in these new forms of work and the informal economy who we are pushing for to be formalized um, and using the new technologies. And uh, in fact, this demand was made, it, th this was a march in 2016 on the city we want. Uh, so um, it, was, it was part of the demands that were seen on the, on the posters of that march. Then other, um, other things which, from, from the side of the workers in the informal economy and new forms of work, we need to be pushing for, uh, for economic recovery. The one is to build and strengthen the, 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 the solidarity economy as part of a deliberate recovery and construction of a new inclusive economy, which is not the same as before. Everybody says we don't want the same normal as the normal we had before COVID. Well, this would be one of the issues is to, is to challenge the capitalist uh, economy by creating a stronger social solidarity economy. Uh, that's another webinar all by itself, but there is new legislation, which is actually in the pipeline at the moment which the Department of Trade and Industries um, is, is piloting. And uh, we've been participating in talking about what that should look like. Then of course, the national health insurance. Clearly, now is the time to take advantage of the improved cooperation between the public and private health sectors during the COVID crisis, and then fast track the process of establishing the national health insurance. Government seems to have heard that one. Then here comes the universal basic income grant, which had been refused before COVID. Um, but the basis has actually been laid for this to be established on a more permanent basis for all workers who are not earning a basic income, even though many flaws in the administration of such grants have to be addressed. And it's already been considered by the Department of Social Development for workers of between 18 and 59, although the treasury is not more on board. So there's lots of struggling. I think that struggle has started. Um, most of the social movements are starting to push for the universal basic income grant. The SACP is now officially pushing for it. Um, President Ramaphosa told us in one NEDLAC meeting, very smugly when we were talking about this issue. Last year, he was the co-chair of the um, Global Commission on the Future of Work. And he told us that he, he raised the issue of a universal basic income grant and everybody in the room looked at him as if he was crazy. And so he's very happy this thing's come up again <laughs> because he says, uh, he feels that he's been vindicated. Well, the problem is he has to convince his, his uh, uh, finance minister. So this is a struggle that we are probably going to be having over the next couple of years. It, it's clearly on the agenda and it's not going to just go away for a second time. Of course, what has to happen is that a broad working class front of progressive forces has to be built to promote a platform of macroeconomic demands, which we were just uh, talking about informally before we started, consistent with the inclusive policy demands of membership-based organizations of workers in the informal economy and new forms of work that would include anti-austerity, anti-liberal, anti-corruption. Um, and this picture is, is from uh, one of the World Social Forums, the one in 2011 in Dakar, where this was actually the uh, StreetNet affiliate in, in Senegal and, and all of its uh, international uh, partners leading this part of, of, of that march. And they had all the formal trade unionists working, you know, walking alongside them. So this, this is doable, getting formal and informal workers to, to form this, this front. So how can workers in the informal economy and new forms of work unite and take a lead in economic transformation? The approach needs to be sector-based. So there'll be sector-based demands and then there'll be the common ones like the basic income grant, for example. And then all economic strategies have to be inclusive, transparent, simple and universally accessible and non-discriminatory. So 
all of these special relief measures that exclude foreigners, it's just a no-no. It's completely, it's completely, no matter what, how you justify it, it's not very workable. Um, we live in a global world and the idea of, of having things only for South Africans, you know, when, when our e economy is, has got an international element is, is not uh, viable. And then we need to ensure that informal work, when it, because many people are doing informal work despite everything, but then they get frustrated by bureaucratic red tape and get forced, forced to operate clandestinely or even close down. That's really counterproductive if one is trying to work for economic recovery. So the elimination of red tape, what do we mean? Establishing well-functioning user-friendly friendly, one-stop shops and or call centers in every district and municipality. The Durban municipality boasts about a one-stop shop. And we, when we tested it, it failed hopelessly. Uh, my, my colleague from the fishing industry spent a whole day being sent from pillar to post. Um, so that's not what we mean. We mean really workable ones. Then there has to be an overhaul of permit systems in every municipality. Permit systems need to be inclusive, they need to be non-discriminatory, and they need to be fit for purpose of getting workers and, informal, and economic units in the informal economy back to work and contributing to informal economy. Permit systems are not designed to keep people out of livelihoods. And this is something not all of our municipalities understand very well. And that means removing obstructive permit requirements, such as reducing permit fees to affordable rates, scrapping requirements to be registered with, with a P CIPC. That's, that's most of the small business development department requirements involve that. And that's, you know, the majority of workers in the informal economy can't manage to succeed uh, to be registered with the CIPC. And then with, um, for economic migrants in the informal economy, scrapping requirements for special visas, because these special visas only apply to migrant workers with formal jobs. So it should be that economic migrants have all they need to prov prov provide is, is their passports, just like South Africans only need to provide their IDs. Um, and then for asylum seekers, they would have to waive asylum seekers permit requirements in the short term because of the massive backlog in processing permits for asylum seekers before COVID-19. And many officers had stopped taking new applications. And this means accepting other forms of identification of asylum seekers, for example, affidavits, etc. So I've talked a little bit about this ILO recommendation 204 on transitions from the informal to the formal economy. Um, some of you might have heard about it before, and that's why I'm not talking a lot about it. I'm mentioning it in passing. It, and I've put here the, um, the uh, link for you to look it up. Um, it's a, it's a rights-based tool which addresses the situation of informal workers uh, to, to do the kind of formalization, rights-based formalization, not formalization which makes you look like you're in the formal economy. Um, clause 12 of that uh, instrument says, when formulating and implementing an integrated policy framework, Members should ensure co coordination across different levels of government and cooperation between the relevant bodies and authorities, such as tax authorities, social security institutions, labor inspectorates, customs authorities, migration bodies and employment services, among others, depending on national circumstances. So it requires government to get out of its silo mindset. Something which has happened to some extent during COVID in the NEDLAC rapid response structures, there's been a really encouraging move away from the silo mentality. We just have to make sure that NEDLAC doesn't go back into its silos after you know, they, they uh, disband the rapid response structures. And then the main issue uh, is the formalization of representation. Uh, our slogan for that is nothing for us without us. It means no plans or uh, policies or anything should be done without negotiating with the people involved. And we mean negotiation as opposed to consultation. Some of our government structures are very good at, um, you know, uh, making it look like they're consulting and then just totally ignoring everything you said during that exercise. Most of you will have had that experience. And that means creating inclusive new bargaining forums 
innovative new bargaining forums, including at local government level. That's something we've been doing quite a bit, even before COVID. And then direct representation in national tripartite forums. So that's where we've been pushing the envelope in EDLAC. Certainly in the direct, in the um, rapid response structures, we've been having more direct uh, uh, representation uh, in different ways, partly through the community constituency. I mentioned to you that we got the taxi drivers into the taxi Lichotla uh, negotiations through, through NEDLAC. So we, I would say we smuggled them in. Um, I'm quite keen to smuggle some more workers in the informal economy into the NEDLAC structures. Um, but ultimately NEDLAC does need to, you know, address this glaring uh, gap. And then at SADC level as well, tripartite bargaining forums to, with direct representation by workers in the informal economy. So for example, informal cross-border traders, that's where the issue has come up at the SADC level. So uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the CITA calls itself the engine behind South Africa's economy, nothing about us without us. Um, and this was one of the uh, marches prior to COVID. That's when, why nobody's wearing masks. It was also the, the City We Want march during 2016. So um, let me stop there. I'll stop sharing so that we can see each other. And I hope I've left enough time for us to have some discussion now. Uh, thanks, Pat. That, that was really great. Um, I guess if we were in a proper room, we could give you a nice round of applause, but I, th I think you should take that as, as given. That was great. Thank you very much. You can tell people to unmute and clap, you know. <laughs> okay. Great. Or otherwise, some people are doing the virtual clapping. Can we do virtual clapping? How do I, how do, I do this? Unmute everybody. I can clap. There we go. Here's there you go. Thank you. So um, just a quick reminder to everybody, there's a lot of requests for the presentation. Um, and we, to be able to send it to you guys, we will need your email. So if you haven't yet put your name and a contact, your name, organization, and a uh, email address in the chat um, column, please do so. Um, then we, we can send that. Um, Pat, is this the same as the version you sent to us earlier, or is this yes. slightly updated? No, it's, it's the same one. All right. We, we do have a copy of that. So please just put your details and we'll, we'll get hold of uh, you soon. Um, I got one question that was shared to me quite early in the talk. Um, so I'll read that out. And then let's take two or three questions as a bundle. Then, Pat, you could respond. And then we'll take another round or so and, and see how time goes. And then you can have a final word. Uh, the question I got sent to me, uh, what opportunities do people who are doing gig work, Uber, Mr. Delivery, et cetera, have to effectively unionize? And how, so that's part of it. How can South Africans resist the shift seen in America where workers are refused their rights by being forced into working temporary or gig jobs? And I suppose that goes partly to what you said earlier, where they treat it as contractors, independent contractors, own account workers, and so on. So that, that's one question. Um, let, let's, take a, let's take a few others. I'm going to move on to the gallery view to make it a bit easier. Um, I, I don't know if you want to put up a hand or write into the comments or the chat. Any questions? Um, Okay, here's one from uh, uh, Comrade Alfred Mofaleka from Kasatu. How much of an obstacle call is it to get more NGOs in NEDLAC, let alone entry requirements for federations? Um, I see a note that Rashida had her hand up. Rashida, do you, do you want to come in? Rashida Muller? Hi, yes, thank you, Lucien. Thank you so much. May I speak? Sure, go for it. Hi, Pat. Once again, I want to thank you, you know, for always being the stalwart for us as the informal sector. But I think, you know, um, SAITA was formed in 2013 with, you know, movements across the country steered by StreetNet International. I think it's time for a bigger mobilization again. I think we're too lax and we're too uh, fragmented. 
Now, CITA is in all provinces, but we know that, uh, you know, we're not, we're, we're not, you know, we have different strengths in different provinces, but there's so many organizations with us today. And I think there has to be a lobby of a stronger voice coming through where we, I don't know what the words, but Pat would probably know how we can together impact better. Because my experience is still showing that the, especially the rural uh, tiles, the little areas where the municipalities get no acknowledgement to who we are. You know, in the in the metros in Durban, maybe and Cape Town and Johannesburg, we would have stronger voices. But as soon as we move inland, where the you know the smaller groups are, the rural areas, you find that 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 voice is lost. So I think a mobilization, a reigniting of the informal economy as a strings and the engine behind the economy of South Africa, we should come at them more, more stronger. And we know under the leadership of Pat Horn uh, in StreetNet and we go as well, there needs to be more proactive moves towards our challenges that we're experiencing. Thank you. Um, I, I think we could take one more and that, that's quite a cluster. Um, is, is anyone, sorry, I've got two galleries, so I'm jumping between, um, and I can't see all the participants. All right. Anyone, anyone? Okay. Um, okay, well, let me throw in, in one, Pat. Um, I, I think part, well, it's, it's two questions. The one is, you've, you've mapped out very well the different types of uh, social relations of production that are involved in the different things that are often put in a group of the informal or the and it's it's presumably going to require very different strategies taxi drivers have got somebody obvious to negotiate with um, and it's clear what the negotiations can be about in the sense that there's a direct relation how, how do we for people that are self-employed um, and not directly dealing with one particular or two particular or three particular buyers. How do you have collective bargaining for such groups? Street traders, for example, people at a train, at a train station. So that's my one question. Once we recognize the different social relations involved and then there's different strategies needed. And when there's no obvious employer or um, who do we negotiate with, that's the one. The other one is a lot of your solutions um, come down to hoping that or trying and pressurizing the state to change its framework to move away. I think the one was anti austerity, anti neoliberal, and, and so on. But can and will states do that? You know, if we can talk about a basic income grant, but the South African state is in a serious financial crisis and it's a fairly well resourced state compared to for example Ghana or something so a lot of eggs seem to be putting in the state's basket but what if the state can't or or simply won't uh, meet these are there are there popular alternatives we can think about so there we go I'll just stop there Okay, thanks. Um, so thanks for those questions. Um, let me start at the beginning. Um, okay, and uh, Lucien, I'm relying on you to look at the chat because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not able to sort of uh, see all of those questions um, uh, while, while I'm uh, uh, answering. Uh, so I might miss some of them. Okay, so basically, the opportunity for gig workers to unionize, you, you know, every, every group of workers who's being oppressed uh, can, can union, can, can organize. It might not be able to form a, an organization that's allowed to be called a union, but quite frankly, that doesn't matter. And there's, there's nothing, I'm going to be answering, you know, along this line all the way through. There's nothing can, that can happen unless workers that are oppressed get organized. Mm -hmm. And that's why, as I've pointed out, that in many sectors of the informal economy, people have their organizations. And even if uh, they haven't been able to register them as unions, 
they are still the same thing because they are membership based organizations of the workers in that particular sector. And that's the foundation for organization. Um, and if there's a problem that they can't become unions, it's because there's a problem with the law, not because there's a problem with the way they've done their organizing. So gig workers can do the same. And when they get uh, sufficiently provoked, like what happened with those entregadores in, uh, in Brazil, then they organize. And throughout history, when workers uh, you know, get sufficiently um, exploited, they start to organize. And then they, they organize to overthrow something which seems to be impossible to overthrow. So thinking about your question, Lucia. Um, so any group of, of workers who eventually became powerful started off as a small group who you know, had to start getting organized. So with gig workers, it's the same. And um, at one stage, I noticed that SAFTU had a service workers union and they had some Uber and taxi fire drivers in that union. I'm not sure what the situation is now. So it, early on, I was paying attention to this because I was nagging the International Transport Workers Federation to stop saying we can't work with gig workers because they're too exploited. And then I said, well, since when did unions not organize mm -hmm. people because they're too exploited? I thought that was what they're supposed to do. And basically, the ITF has moved a lot in that respect. There's, there's lots of organizations of the people that work for those big multinationals, like, um, I don't know about Airbnb, but certainly with um, Lyft and uh, Uber and all of these ones. And, you know, the thing is that um, the, the, the issues change because now the people that they, they still, the, the, the people who affect their work might not call themselves their employers, but they're still the people that are supposed to be responsible for them. And as you know, there have been lots of court cases about this. And in South Africa, uh, Uber lost a court case like this where the, the, the high court said, you are responsible for those people as if they were your workers. They are deemed to be your employees. Then I think uh, there was another court case that overturned that. So there's a lot of struggle going on at the litigation level. But in order to, uh, all of the workers in these sectors have got themselves together and they've had demonstrations. So organization is the first one. And there's no worker who can't organize themselves. The fact that you want to organize yourself and society doesn't recognize you as a worker is something that you have to, so what, what becomes important is for workers to have the confidence to proclaim that they are workers and to say, we are organizing because we are workers, whether or not society recognizes us as workers or not. After all, okay, many of, uh, for those, of the, for those of us that are in my age group, when we worked in the unions, 80% uh, of the workforce were not recognized as workers in terms of the law because no black workers were recognized as workers. And we said they were workers and we organized them and had unions and eventually we forced those unions to be recognized. So we are now at that situation with these kinds of unions. If, mm -hmm. if a person is a worker and they're doing work, as far as we are concerned, they need to be organized. They need to proclaim that they are workers and uh, eventually everybody else will have to come around to that if the organizations are effective in, in getting that kind of recognition. So they have to go through those same struggles for recognition that the formal sector workers had to do a hundred years ago. <clears throat> so um, how can workers avoid being put into precarious or gig, gig work? Again, it comes down to organization. Now, when, when you are in a threatened uh, work types of work where, where you can see the writing on the wall, you can see the way technology is going, you can see your job is pretty much one of those that's going to go first. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, trade unions, formal trade unions are often very reactive in nature and very defensive in nature. Hmm. I think that unions have to be more forward looking and you know the unions uh, in South Africa have heard me say this many times before. So I'm not saying something I haven't said both to Kasatu and to Saftu and to Naktu. Um, of basically saying, look, look at what's happening in the economy and what is it that we can do about it? You can probably sort of keep certain jobs going for so long. Um, are you just kicking the can down the road? And then there's the whole issue of you know new strategies like skilling and restrict skilling for the new kinds of work that comes up. And that when the gig um, 
when people do go into the gig economy, because that's definitely where, where employment uh, um, opportunities exist, um, that uh, we then push for there to be proper working conditions there and focus on promoting uh, regulation, which means pushing the government to do the regulation. But it needs to be pushed from below by organized workers. That's the key issue. Um, so basically, if workers want to avoid being put into precarious gig work, uh, if they belong to a union, I would suggest that that union sits down and develops a strategy for what needs to happen to those kinds of work. And if they see certain ones that it's a matter of time before they're going to disappear, you know, try to be one step ahead. Don't let the employer to be the one to make the decision when uh, certain technology takes over. Start from below and say, well, you know, we want to introduce these new kinds of technologies so that you can be a step ahead. I think, you know, that's the smartest way to go about it. But it can only be done with a strongly organized uh, body of organized workers in that sector. So we spend a lot of time trying to convince the unions about this because failing that, the unions don't have a prospect of doing much better than the Luddites did during the first industrial revolution. You have to think about that. And I think that the unions have got all the previous examples to look at to, 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 to do better now and to, and to be more strategic. So it involves very, very strategic thinking on the part of the trade unions. Um, the issue about entry requirements into NEDLAC. Now, NEDLAC is a very bureaucratic space to work in. And uh, to be honest, when it comes to workers in the informal economy, we pretty much smuggled our way in there. In, in, in 1996, when I was in Geneva with the current Minister of Finance, who in those days was the Minister of Labor. And he said, Ahman, you must go into the community constituency. Well, it's not ideal to be fobbed off into the community constituency, but that is the space that we've used. And whatever things we have gained through NEDLAC, we have had to use that space and it's not an easy space because it's, it's a highly contested space. Um, and the way that they phrased the law of NEDLAC was to, to put in this community constituency and it was one of Tito's inventions. Uh, a lot of people think it was very brilliant. I'm not so sure personally, but you know, if that's what you've got, then that's what you have to use. Um, and that space, the community constituency consists of sectors. And the sectors according to the constitution of NEDLAC are women, rural people, uh, civics and residence associations, disabled people, people with disabilities, youth, uh, cooperatives. And then one that sneaked in uh, in the early nineties, financial sector campaign co coalition, all the people that used to be called unbankable before there was a quite a successful financial sector campaign, which resulted in more access to financial products actually, and the introduction of the Mzansi accounts. So if you don't belong to one of those sectors and none of those sectors that I've described include workers in the informal economy. So to be honest, I got invited to, to go there to represent women initially. And then uh, more recently, I got asked to, to be a negotiator for the Financial Sector Campaign Coalition and used the space to talk about workers in the informal economy and eventually persuaded the community constituency informally, because it's not in the constitution, that we should be also talking on behalf of workers in the informal economy. And that's what, what, I, what I mean when I say we've smuggled in to some of the summits and so on representatives of workers in the informal economy, because officially speaking, that sector is not part of NEDLAC in terms of the constitution. So we can't attend all NEDLAC structures. We can only attend three of the four chambers. And to be honest, those ones that deal with most of the laws are those three chambers. Uh, we get a foot in the door from time to time because we put up some, you know, we put forward very good work about recommendation 204 in the informal economy. So we've managed to carve out quite a space there. And in the Decent Work Country Program, which is a, 
uh, the steering committee, which is which is a NEDLAC structure that monitors the ILO's Decent Work Country Program, we've got a very big part of that, which is dedicated to the implementation of Recommendation 204. But you know what? That took us about 14 years to get there of constant nagging and pushing and having you know demonstrations and every type of, of action you, you can think of. So, um, you know, and, and it's still not a good structure. It's, it's not a conducive structure. It's just the only thing we've got to use. And then, you know, when we got a bit of space during uh, COVID, then we grabbed that space too. So it, it means, you know, being very wide awake and seeing what's available and, and jumping in there and persuading people that they need you. And because of the fact that during COVID, in order to have very inclusive policies, they did need us. There's, the government's talked more about the informal economy since COVID than they ever have before. It never used to appear in the, in the president's SONA speeches. Now the informal economy is mentioned in every single fellow South Africans speech that we've had since the beginning of COVID. So, you know, we, we're seeing more recognition, but that's come from a lot of fighting. There's no uh, silver bullet for that. Um, so um, we, we're constantly talking to the workers in the informal economy that we work with, who we've managed to get into some of the structures, like the recommendation 204 extended national task team. We've now got representatives of five sectors of the informal economy who sit in that structure. Um, and we're looking to, to extend that. Um, so, you know, Rashida, your question of how to get the stronger voice, I've got bad news for you. There's no shortcut on this one. Exactly what you are doing, all the lobbying that you are doing, the advocacy that you are doing, the when you bully the municipalities, uh, organizing people in the sector, always trying to improve the level of organization. That is the only way to get the stronger voice. So you're already doing all of those things and then you get frustrated because you meet somebody that hasn't heard about you. It reminds me of when we were in the unions in the 70s and the 80s. Nobody had heard of us. Uh, not the way people have heard of Kasatu now. In those days, we never dreamt we'd have a thing the size of Kasatu. Well, the size that Kasatu was a couple of years ago, at least. So, um, so it's a long process, Rashida. And, um, you know, that's why we need to get the young ones involved because uh, it's, it's, a long, it's a long struggle. Um, and it needs a lot of persistence and, and, and being very focused, actually. So not being all over the place. Um, and that's why, you know, all of these workshops that we have, um, getting onto a common focus. And that's why recommendation 204 is useful because it gives us a common focus so that government can't use the excuse of saying, oh, these people are just, you know, they've all got different demands and they're all fighting with each other and what, what. Um, the, the recommendation 204 gives us a focus and it gives us something which is hard to, for government to, uh, to deny. And that's why we've got as far as we have. Um, so, um, so Lucy and the, 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 you obviously have to attend one of our negotiation skills workshops because you asked all the questions that we train the workers in the informal economy about um, how you do negotiations when you don't have an employer. Workers in the informal economy, we have nine steps uh, that I'm going to just mention. Very, you know, the first one is you ask people what their problems are. No one has a problem with that. Second, you take every problem, you convert it into a negotiating demand. Uh, once you've converted it into a negotiating demand, you decide who's responsible for this issue. So who do we negotiate with? So that's your negotiating counterpart. And unlike formal workers who automatically just go to the employers, informal workers have to be a whole lot smarter because they have to correctly uh, identify the negotiating counterpart. So with uh, people like street traders and, and, um, and waste pickers, for example, one of the most common negotiating counterparts for most of their demands, not all necessarily, would be municipalities. And then, you know, which department in the municipality, et cetera. So that becomes your counterpart. And then you treat that thing the same way you, you would treat an employer in a negotiating process. The negotiations issues, I've already answered your question. You, you find out what people's problems are. You don't come beforehand and decide what would be good. There's a lot of people who, especially academics, who seem to think, and this is not an attack on you, Lucien, um, but a, a lot of academics uh, say to us, what would be the right kinds of issues to start organizing these people? Uh, should it be micro 
uh, finance. Um, because it obviously can't be uh, working conditions. Well, there's nothing obvious at all about that. The point is that when you organize workers, you don't start before you even organizing them, decide what the issues are. You find out from them what the issues are. They'll tell you, and you'll have no shortage of issues the minute you start to organize them. So sometimes they'll be what you uh, predicted, and sometimes it'll be new issues, and then you adjust to that. So a bottom-up organizing process where you organize people, you find out the issues from them. Then on each issue, now th this is where it becomes complicated. One of the issues of informal workers would be lack of social protection. It is one of the common issues. Now that's a bit more complicated because that involves a national negotiation. It can't be done at local government level like uh, you know, solid waste management policy can be negotiated between waste pickers and local governments. Spatial management for informal traders can be negotiated with local governments. Uh, social protection uh, can't be negotiated by one sector of workers in the informal economy because here everybody has to unite and then it involves a much more centralized level of negotiating and you have to then face what we're discovering now with the basic income grant discussions, the Department of Social Development, a whole series of, uh, of economic departments, COGTA and SALGO who are responsible for municipalities, and then of course, the big one, the Treasury. And then there's the Presidency as well, although they're not as tough as the Treasury. So, so putting together that negotiating forum is, is uh, you know, a much more challenging one. And it involves starting to get specialized about things like macroeconomic policy and things like that. And uh, not just being specialized on, uh, on, uh, uh, on social protection issues. So, um, so that's the approach. Um, and, we, uh, uh, and I'm serious, Lucy, and we've, we've got, um, uh, we've got um, courses that we do with workers in the informal economy. So that most of our workers in the informal economy know these basics now. They know that they can negotiate and how to identify their, their counterparts. The problem is that we don't have that many statutory bargaining forums and getting people into those forums, I would say that's the big fight we're having at the moment all over the place. And then sometimes you get people into those forums like last year in Swane, we managed to get a forum negotiated. We, we had the, uh, the terms of reference agreed um, so that it no longer depended on, on individuals. And uh, what happened? There was a political change in Pretoria, which is still going on. Um, so the, the mayor and the MMC who, who kind of supported us at the time disappeared. We got a whole lot of you know, new people there. The officials who had no excuse not to respect what had been agreed, used that as an excuse as well as COVID of course. To, to stop the monthly meetings. We, we are now insisting that that negotiating forum is still legally binding and that no matter who's in government there, which political party and which faces are, are MMCs, they have to respect that. But uh, the negotiating counterparts that we are dealing with because they don't come from a well-established industrial framework, they still don't really understand that when you make an agreement and you sign it, <laughs> you're legally bound to stick by it. So, so that, that's where we are at the moment on that. It's where we were in the 70s and 80s with those unions before unions were forced onto the employers in South Africa. That's where we are with our counterparts uh, in the informal economy. So let me stop there and give space for some more questions. Thanks, Pat. Um, I, I just see, I wanted to ask Clement, um, who's involved with taxis and taxi workers. Um, I, I, uh, Clement, I, I don't know how good your connection is. And also ask Eva, um, involved in ARO, if, if you would like to perhaps talk a bit about your organizing uh, experiences. No pressure, um, but if you do want to, um, I think it would be really wonderful to, to hear. Um, but while you're thinking about that, um, is there someone, are there any other questions? Don't be shy. We've got a, a really great opportunity here to ask all sorts of, of key questions.
Mm. Ah, you go. Can I please hear the question again? Hello? Hi, Eva. Hi, you how are you? I'm good, thanks. Can you please repeat the question for me? No, Eva, I was just wondering if, if you want to talk a bit about your some of the experiences you've had in, in organizing. Um, given your background, I think it could perhaps enrich the conversation. Okay. Uh, the thing that especially the challenges that we had in organizing at Aro. Uh, we were like, we were doing damage control. Let me just put it like that. We were doing damage control from most of the reclaimers always because, because at first the municipality would tell them that we're promising you this and that and that and that. Then they don't fulfill all those promises. Then came Aro. When Aro came, people didn't believe at first. But yes, thanks to Wigo, with the support that they gave us to continue going to the people and talk to them time and again, time and again. Now, that's when the people starting to, to believe that what we're saying is true because they see in other places, like there is action, there is recognition, especially in those suburbs that they must not allow to be so that when, that's when now people want to come and join the organization. But it's so hard now to go to them because the funding that we had from Wigo, the time has ended. So we're struggling. We're struggling. Although we push some of the things, it's so hard, especially with this COVID thing. Our work is so hard. It's really so hard because in most places, Reclaimers are not now allowed to work because residents are afraid that they will catch this COVID or they'll come back with COVID and come and touch their bins and so on and so on. So it's a really, it's a, it's a really stressing process now. So we are trying our best to keep the reclaimers updated about this COVID thing and even to help them with like soaps and so on, the donations that we get from Coca-Cola, Oxfam, and other entities that are helping us. Thanks, Eva. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I noted, I, I don't know if Clint wants to say anything. I uh, have a hand and now a comment from, from Ben, uh, Karen Benzie. So um, perhaps, perhaps uh, Karen Benzie, if you want to come in quickly. Sure, thanks. And thanks for a very informative presentation, Pat. Um, yeah, I, I was just wondering, um, you know, given the um, organizing that is uh, ongoing at the moment, and given that there seems to be somewhat of a window of opportunity, at least in terms of being noticed, um, what would you think has, um, what would you think could strengthen existing informal worker organizing efforts? Um, and actually uh, another separate question is, you know, I mean, I think that the asks you listed are spot on. So in terms of, for example, a basic income grant, access to Wi-Fi, um, and what I would kind of interpret as more enabling conditions um, fostered by municipalities. I mean, what more can we hope for, actually? Um, you know, surely we should be looking, you know, to, to more than that. I mean, I think formal industry and formal business is supported and subsidized all the time by the state. Uh, you know, are there examples of the ways in which informal workers can be supported by the state and in, in the forms of, yeah, subsidies or incentives that you have seen that you could maybe, um, that you can maybe refer us to. Thanks. Um, I see Clement uh, doesn't seem to have a microphone showing, um, but I see somebody, Jane Barrett's added, 
to, to add to Eva's input, ARO has gone from zero to over 2,000 signed up Reclaimer members in jo Joburg in three years. So that, that's, that's very encouraging. Um, are there any other questions? Because I think this will probably be the last round. Um, are there any other questions anybody wants to put? Um, okay. Um, Pat, uh, I'll just throw in, in one. Um, my, my second question was one which um, I don't know if you quite answered it. It was just, what happens if the state can't or won't um, implement particular macroeconomic policies? Because um, I, I know we're saying anti-neoliberalism and that, but we've been saying that for even to the old government. So it's going on, neoliberalism in South Africa has been going on since about 1979. Um, so what, what happens if the state won't provide an enabling environment won't uh, provide these sort of reforms. And what happens if it can't? Um, I'm just thinking in our own municipality, it's a s local government here is unable to maintain a basic water system. It's, it's unlikely to be rolling out free Wi-Fi. What, what do we do then? Are there popular self-managed alternatives we can think about? Um, I'll just leave it there. So Pat, unless there are any other questions, oh, Eva says we're now approaching 5,000 even in other places. Um, unless any other questions, I'm going to hand it over to you, uh, Pat. Um, I think you can answer and, and maybe put in any kind of last words, and then I'll, I'll just wrap it up with some news about next about our next talk. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks for bringing that question back. I forgot about it, so um, and I wanted to answer it. Um, Karen, nice to see you in the space. Uh, nice to see the the young generation. Um, being interested in the informal economy, actually. Um, so um, to strengthen existing organizations, um, I think th uh, the main issue to strengthening organizations is, is, is to get some recognition. Um, and so, you know, there, there are a lot of ways that can be done. The, the state can help by uh, working with them more enthusiastically than, than they do. And some departments, have been quite good. Um, it's a little bit uneven, but that recognition is quite important because when, if you take say a group of informal traders somewhere and they work well with the municipality, so that when the traders get a problem, then their leaders are able to help them sort it out. It helps the organization to, to grow um, it, it, because the, the leaders are able to sell, solve problems. And, um, you know, there can be some sort of a, um, a synergy between uh, resolving the problems of, of members um, and uh, achieving some of their, their objectives and growth of the organization. Um, the, um, the, the, the other question about support, you know, about, you know, grants and things like that. Um, it definitely, because of the fact that the informal economy is, is, is a moving target, it's changing all the time. And what we can anticipate post COVID even more than before, it's not new, but maybe more than before is the world of work was changing already. Um, this uh, typical situation of, of work being something which you did on a, for one employer uh, on a full-time basis. And, you know, that's become more and more of a pipe dream and the different kinds of working uh, arrangements have become much more common. So the society that got developed along the lines of the eight to five people isn't the kind of society in any event that we're going towards. So basically, um, there, there is a necessity to have income security for the large number of people who may be working but earning very little or because very few people who are uh, uh, officially unemployed are actually not working. Most of them are, are hustling, they're doing something to, to earn a living. And a lot of that hustling is, is a kind of, is, it's a livelihood. So, so they're definitely, you know, the, the issue of the basic income grant, um, which, is, which is developing now, is, is definitely something which would be important. Because where workers in the informal economy have that basic income grant, then they, they live in a lower level of distress. They might still have to do a lot of hustling and they might still you know, have a lot of, of, of problems in the work that they do, but it basically uh, reduces the level of distress and the, the absolute level of poverty. Um, 
So, so I think that the basic income grant is something we all have to fight for. And now most of society is supporting that. So basically, um, workers, the membership-based organizations that I've talked to you about, they've been participating in a number of, um, of coalitions and networks. The 2019 coalition is a, is a coalition of, of organizations as well as the workers' organizations. The Working Class Summit, which was started by SAFTU a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, I think that those kind of alliances of organizations that have similar interests are, are very important. So, you know, uh, much as, as Rashida has come across people in the rural areas that haven't heard of them, there are not that many people in South Africa that haven't heard of CITA when you come to the government departments and so on. And that's definitely a change over the last five years. So, so that recognition helps the organizations a lot. Um, and then the solidarity, um, you know, and and the uh, what we've been doing, which is to which is to teach people negotiating skills, and try to work towards this thing of setting up negotiating forums. You know, given that we work with workers in the informal economy, once workers in the informal tree. In India, there's there's a it's one of the few countries where there's a statutory statutory system of bargaining forums at municipal level. It's called town vending committees, and that only came into being in the law which was passed in 2014 called the Street Vendors uh, Protection of Livelihoods and Regulation of Street Vending Act. And and interestingly, that one got passed uh, just after just before the last elections where the BJP won the elections and the BJP wanted to oppose it, but they were scared of losing the support of the traders and the traders did a, a hunger strike. So they, they, they allowed it to go through the, through the, 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 the House of Lords. And then it was passed just before the elections. They won the election and they were now obliged to, uh, to, to comply with this, this law that got passed against their will. So, you know, sometimes you have to fight for this kind of legislation. So um, to come back to, to your question, uh, Lucien, that you asked, um, uh, when, when I talked about demands to put to government, issues in which to lobby and demonstrate, I wasn't assuming we were going to win all those issues. Um, I think that I see it in the same way in the 70s and 80s when we lobbied against the apartheid government and it seemed like an impossibility. But we, we developed strategies and we just went, you know, it, it, there were different sites of struggle, some people outside the country, others stayed inside the country. Some of us went into the unions. Um, there were all sorts of different things that we did, but we all fought against that thing. And at the time we were not that sure whether we were going to succeed or not. Um, so I think when you know what you want to do, you have to identify your demands very clearly and you have to, have to do whatever you can to make them happen. Sometimes you'll struggle for years. Sometimes maybe you won't succeed, but your chances of succeeding are higher if you have focused well on your demands and if you've got enough unity from as many different sectors of the society as possible. And so these alliances between workers in the informal economy and their organizations and formal sector trade unions a very small example we had in, in Durban. So Karen, I don't know how old you were in 2010, but since you come from Durban, you probably remember that there was a fight where the municipality wanted to sell off the Warwick uh, market precinct air, um, area. And, and we, we had a campaign, it was called the World Class Cities for All campaign. It was led by uh, the street trade organizations, StreetNet International actually, the organization that I, I was in at the time. And, um, we got the support of all the trade unions, as well as the South African Communist Party. The ANC got divided um, because the municipality that wanted to sell this property to some private uh, uh, interest, um, you know, wanted to do that. And then other people in the ANC wanted to, uh, you know, do what the people wanted. But we eventually won that fight. We, we stopped that sale from going ahead and we stopped that 
land from being sold. And it was, uh, it was, it is an area of Durban where we have between 7,000 and 10,000 workers in the informal economy in the Warwick Triangle precinct. And all those people were going to lose their livelihoods. And we, you know, it was a small issue, but it was a great victory. And the uh, city manager at the time was extremely furious. I think he's still furious. I think he still holds it against us, but it was something where we had working class solidarity between formal and informal workers, plus social movements, the environmental organizations, the Abashlani um, Basem uh, Jondolo, the, um, as well as the uh, Shack Dwellers International, all the social movements and so on. We basically all put up a big show of strength and some people argue now who it was who really got us to win that, but I'm not sure, but overall there was a massive show of strength and we won it. So, um, Lucien, you know, I, I think we have to, uh, uh, we, we have to have our demands very clearly as to what we want the state to do. Some of these are going to be extremely difficult to win. Some of them are issues that the state can't do, as you, as you rightly point out. It's a bit like when trade unions go on strike against retrenchments, it's an employer who's got no option. Um, that's, it's, it, that's not the best kind of strike, a retrenchment strike. In the trade union movement, that's the worst kind of strike you can have, um, because uh, obviously, unless they've been lying, which sometimes happens too, but sometimes it's, it's true and, and their economic reasons. And that's why I've suggested that I think that if the trade unions strengthen their relationships with the membership-based organizations of workers in the informal economy, start to found unions of gig workers, and start to have more strategic discussions about other ways forward, other than just defensive strategies. I think we need more proactive strategies. We need strategies, especially on this issue of the digital economy and what we're supposed to do with it. And, you know, fighting for control of the means of production, of the means of digital production. Um, so, so those are the kinds of demands. And then, you know, the same way that we did in the fight against apartheid, uh, the better organized we are, the, the more likely we are to achieve some of those. Some of them we probably wouldn't achieve. And then as you go along, you constantly reassess your demands. And this is, this is very similar to what we had during the time we were fighting against apartheid. So look, you know, we, we won in the sense that we, you know, we got rid of apartheid, but you know, look what we have now. So some of those things we haven't won yet because we, we you know, the class issues haven't been tackled sufficiently and we're still dealing with them. So that's still a continuation of what we were doing in the old days. But because the ground is changing under our feet and the labor market doesn't look the same as it looked then. And as worker organizations, both the trade unions as well as the informal worker organizations, I think we have to take the lead in that in what kind of worker organization we have to have, which is a broad worker organization that covers all kinds of workers, including those that get officially get called contractors or gig workers, or, you know, people have all sorts of nasty names they call some people. There was a time they used to call uh, waste pickers scavengers. I mean, that's a terrible name uh, to call people, but that's what people, you know, what some of the academics used to call them. And, um, and said it was technically a correct term. So workers in these sectors, they usually decide what they want to be called. Aro calls itself reclaimers, and that's the term which, which they use and you know, demand recognition for that, and we all recognize that. Uh, and so basically um, uh, with, with informal traders as well, there was a long argument whether they should be called street beds or informal traders or uh, cuenta propistas as they call them in Latin America. And um, so basically it's, it, that's the issue of claiming the space, uh, claiming your, your recognition as workers, building a, a strong movement, then building alliances with other worker organizations and um, social movements. Uh, because some of these, like these macroeconomic demands, those are much broader than just the worker organizations. And there we need to work together with all the social movements as well, who have the same demand as we do, for example, on the austerity issues. Uh, against corruption, there's a pretty pretty broad movement uh, on that. Um, and, and that's pretty important as well. 
So, Lucien, I think it's the same. It's when one when one um, makes these demands, one doesn't do it with the assumption that, that we're going to win within a particular period of time, but it's with the purpose of having a movement with identifiable targets and objectives around which we can mobilize. So I hope I answered it better this time. There we go. Uh, thanks very much, Pat. Um, I don't think anybody could have done a better job. This has been really fantastic and we'd really like to thank you for making yourself available for this wonderful lucid presentation. Um, I think everybody has learned a, a lot here. Um, I think, uh, I, I don't think there's much more we can say. There's a few more comments in the, uh, in the chat bar. We need a United Front of Workers, uh, Karen saying we can't turn away from state institutions, but we can't discount the point that the importance, for example, of non-civic, uh, a non-state civic and other collectivities, um, efforts, for example, in COVID, which personally in, in this town, <laughs> made a huge difference. I mean, the corruption and the complete incompetence of, of the state here is quite a big thing. Um, so there's a few other comments. I'm assuming everybody um, who can and would, uh, somebody says Solidarity Forum, loads of people, Pat, are saying wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And I think we can only echo that. Again, if you haven't put your name and an email down, um, we won't be able to send the presentation. I think most people have. I just want to uh, mention our next talk is provisionally scheduled for the 25th of November. And uh, provisionally we have Tengo Tengela from Nahawu who will be talking about the, the battles in the state sector around work, work and around wages and, and what, what the responses are around frontline workers and so on. So our first one, we had Mometwe Sabe from Softu. This time we're very happy to have Wigo Next time, uh, we're going to have uh, Kasatu. And I think this is also trying to show we want a, a broad approach as well. We're not taking sides in these different battles. I think we, we can all pick up on Pat's key points here that it's strategy, it's unity, it's a positive identity, um, it's campaigning that matters, that not everything we're facing is completely new, and that if things could be won in the 1970s, goodness, we under that state, under that regime, we still should have some hope now. And finally, I think, Pat, just to underline your, your key point, it's not perfect conditions that lead to strong unions. It's not standard employment relations that lead to unions. It's unions and work organizations that lead to things like standard employment relations. So a lot of hard work to do, but thank you. I think you've inspired us and everybody shared great examples of some of the things that are being done. Thank you everybody for your, your time. We will be putting up a recording. We will be putting up an audio as well, and we will be um, circulating. If you guys are in the Eastern Cape, pop around and see us. We're always happy to see people. And uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening further.